Hi, many thanks for the warm welcome. It's great to be at uh, EuroPython today. And uh, my name is Alexander. Uh, I'm working on the exchange team at Smarkets. I'm one of the main authors um, of uh, MarchBot, which is a technology we're going to discuss today. And uh, this is my colleague, uh, Mika. Um, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hello. I am at Smarkets, the head of security, and a few other things. Cool. So, um, what we want to talk today about is uh, MarchBot is an open source project we are doing, and um, the aim of it is to make sure that you automatically always have uh, a green master, which means uh, the head of your master uh, should always um, pass CI tests. And uh, sadly, this is not uh, um, generally the case in most uh, CI setups. I will discuss why that is, and I mean, it's one of my pet peeves because it's one of those things which actually is not particularly difficult um, to fix and I think gives you big benefits and it should really be the default uh, with uh, GitHub or GitLab or whatever and at the moment it's not, you need some external tool like uh, MarchBot. So uh, for later I'm uh, going to come back to this. There's some, something slightly wrong with this picture. Um, uh, have a look, maybe you can spot it. I, I will reveal it later. Um, Cool. Um, so uh, let me give a brief outline of the talk. So I'm going to talk about what's the problem with the typical CI setup is, also uh, how our journey uh, at Smarkets was, uh, how to fix a typical CI setup and uh, uh, from a conceptual perspective uh, and also from a practical perspective because conceptually it's actually quite easy, uh, but you need to do more uh, work to make it work in, in uh, practice. And, uh, in addition to um, solving uh, the problem of, of never having a, a broken master for, from uh, green pull requests, um, uh, I'm also going to talk about some of the additional features that March uh, provides for you, which uh, are also of interest um, uh, uh, in our particular setup, but I think also for other people. And uh, as the audience takeaways, uh, I uh, think. Uh, the obvious one is if you're using GitLab, uh, I encourage you to use MarchBot, but even if you're not using GitLab, uh, I think uh, there should be some useful takeaways. Uh, it should be clear how to adapt this to other things, and I will also uh, briefly mention some alternative technologies you can use, e.g. for uh, GitHub or how to do it yourself. And uh, hopefully uh, there's also going to be a little bit of uh, useful um, Git uh, workflow discussion. Um, so, cool. Um, so. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, at the risk of uh, stating the obvious, uh, let's briefly see why broken master is bad. I mean, the foremost problem, which uh, actually was quite painful when I started at Smarkets, is uh, that when you can't rely on master working correctly, when you start new feature work uh, on a branch, uh, it can be a very high overhead to figure out what actually is uh, your fault and what was the fault that you started off from a broken uh, master. Uh, obviously, it also makes it more likely that you ship broken stuff to production, which is very undesirable. And uh, a more subtle point is it also makes it much harder to sort of retrace uh, your steps. Uh, like, if you find some undesirable behavior uh, which you would like to bisect, or so bisect is going to break pretty badly if, if you don't know which commits have random unrelated uh, uh, failures, uh, which are not really the bug introduction uh, you're looking for. Cool. Uh, so let me start out with just mentioning the Smarkets workflow, as it was when I started at Smarkets. And uh, basically, Alice, uh, the rockstar coder, sort of uh, wrote some codes and sent um, a patch via Slack uh, to uh, Bob, the uh, software builder, and, and Bob either rejected it, in which case, we go back to square one or approved it, and in which case uh, um, Alison pushed it straight to master uh, with some additional uh, meta information for auditing purposes, which uh, Mika can talk about a little bit, but uh, that kind of was it, and then CI was one. And I mean, uh, obviously this is not ideal because it caused frequent uh, breakage. I mean, in principle, of course, developers were meant to test things thoroughly before pushing them, but uh, it's much better to automate that with CI. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, basically there are two reasons that a master can be broken. So the first one is a uh, bad workflow, and uh, I'm going to talk about how to fix that. Uh, MarchBot will do it for you. 
Uh, and the second one is admittedly a bit more difficult. Uh, it's flaky builds, so you can still, if you have a good workflow, which most people don't, uh, uh, be bit by non-determinism. Um, but that's difficult to avoid in a sufficiently complex project. Okay, so uh, the obvious solution to um, uh, well, improve this workflow is like maybe do CI first before you push things to master and maybe don't slack patches, use some review system like uh, GitLab or GitHub or Fabricator provide. And in order to get this uh, happening, uh, we first had to get, or I had to get uh, approval to, to uh, get uh, GitLab Enterprise Edition, which I did, and then uh, we were sort of closer to the typical best practice uh, workflow, which is uh, uh, you send some pull requests, someone reviews it in some review system, uh, it passes CI and then gets merged into master. Uh, can you just raise your hands how many people roughly use a workflow like this? So I would say the majority of people. And uh, do you sometimes have broken master despite using this workflow? Yes, okay, cool, excellent. So, uh, uh, so uh, there are complications to this because master moves. So there really is another uh, choice point, namely do you have a merge conflict, yes or no? And if yes, you go back to square one. If no, it becomes a new master. But there's more. I mean, uh, master moving, of course, obsoletes your CI result. So uh, the next choice point is do you have a logical conflict? And if yes, now you've got a broken master, and that's that. So um, how can we fix this? Well, it turns out there actually is uh, a way to fix it with GitLab out of the box without any other tooling. So this might be a little bit hard to read, but basically you need to configure um, GitLab so that uh, you only allow um, merge requests to be merged in if they pass CI and you insist that it needs to be a fast forward merge. And the effect this has is that the new master will always be what you tested in CI, which is what you want, right? I mean, you don't want to merge something in master if it hasn't been tested properly. Uh, so the unfortunate thing is the way it works is uh, the one who does the rebasing all the time is you. So, I mean, someone approves your merge request, uh, you rebase it to make sure it's current, and then it goes through CI, and by the time CI has done something, maybe someone else has got his merge request in, and then you need to rebase again. And uh, this um, can be ever so slightly painful, uh, because it can take a very long time, because everyone is then merging, uh, is, is racing to rebase their things faster, and. Uh, uh, so the ice layers are spinning like mad, and, and uh, you sort of have a, a sad rockstar developer. And uh, so that rockstar developer in this case was my former colleague uh, Daniel Goran. He decided to do something about it as a sad rockstar developer wrote a bot. And this is the story of this bot. So what does this bot do? Well, it does, it does a rebasing of master uh, into your branch for you. So what CI actually tests will be the new master branch as it will be, and therefore it will always be green. Uh, does anyone know the difference to the previous thing where you sort of did it manually? Uh, so there's one, there's one box missing as uh, the master moved. And, and that's kind of important because like if all the bot did is like press rebase, 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 it would still not scale at all because um, you would have uh, uh, well, N branches um, where N is the number of open pull requests rebuilding all the time and something gets merged to master which is not scalable. Uh, so uh, the way it works instead is uh, March bot maintains um, a queue and merges things in one by one. And so technically, uh, there still is this check, uh, um, but it's just if people sort of push things directly to master subverting the pro pro um, process. But uh, cool. Um, very quickly, um, I want to discuss how it can happen that you have a green pull request and master is still broken. Uh, one thing that's important to realize is even if you've got a good setup, not all your um, commits will actually go through CI, generally because it's simply not scalable. Not even Google can do that, for example. Uh, so you will have some, um, normally what happens when you push some things, the last commits that you push go through CI, and all the other commits before don't make it through CI. Um, uh, so, but let's look at um, those two pull requests here, pull request one and pull request two. Uh, they both are green on the last commits and tested in CI, but um, it doesn't mean there is no logical conflict between them. And then when you merge it in, you end up with a broken master, okay? And um, uh, a couple of examples in practice houses can happen. One thing that happens quite frequently is uh, you basically uh, 
change an API in one pull request, make it better, like uh, fix some type on some method name or so on, someone else adds an additional call side. Uh, similar thing is like if I improve test coverage in one pull request and someone else um, uh, changes the API, so this is also going to break. And uh, uh, the most interesting case, I think, is, is fragile base class problem where uh, even if you have quite a good uh, workflow and people don't step on each other's toes in general, um, you uh, can have um, interesting breakage due to some base class far away being modified in one pull request and, and uh, you modifying a subclass in some other pull request and uh, uh, you just sort of in inadvertently rely on some implementation detail. Okay, and none of those things will actually cause a merge request. So you will get a broken master with a default uh, CI model. So uh, I just very briefly want to show that it's quite simple to set merge up. So uh, you basically create SSH key, create a GitLab account and token, and then you just uh, type in this line. So you see there are sort of three things in orange. This is what you need to supply. You need to supply the SSH key, you need to supply the token, and you need to supply your GitLab URL, and, and that's it. You're, you're good to go. I mean, you then add Margebot to all the projects. You want her to take care of things for you. And uh, I'm actually going to do this towards the end. Uh, but basically, uh, the workflow is exactly the same as you would normally do with, with GitLab instead of pressing on uh, merge. If um, build succeeds, uh, you uh, assign um, to merge, and merge takes care of it for you. If it uh, succeeds, it will merge it in. If it doesn't succeed, um, it will leave a comment and reassign it back to you, telling you why, what the problem was. Cool. Um, so the conceptual fix, as I said, is actually quite simple. All you need to do is like maintain a queue and go through it one by one, and, and uh, your master will be always green. Um, so the main difficulty is with actually making it uh, work in practice. You need usability, familiarity, and scalability for this. Familiarity means you need to build on some existing solution like GitHub or GitLab that people are happy to use. Uh, so there is some sort of uh, spit work to be done uh, to, to um, bend the GitLab API to actually allow for this because it's not really meant uh, with this particular use case in mind. Uh, and um, then there are various things you need to do for usability, like for example, Margebot is quite good at leaving comments telling you about what's happening. We have some Slack channel integration and stuff like this. Uh, we also have the uh, small trick of prefixing the name with space so it comes up first when you assign to is the first user you see. Uh, so scalability is uh, more work, and you don't actually need it immediately. I mean, we started out doing March bot in a non-scalable way and worked completely fine for maybe a dozen users or so. But if you've got 70 users like we have now, uh, it no longer works if you uh, basically uh, run a single queue and do each merge request individually in this queue. So you need you need to batch them up and. Um, I'm going to very briefly explain how this works. So uh, this is similar to the previous slide. So we sort of have like um, uh, uh, a couple of pull requests, uh, three. One is failing, two other ones are fine. And then uh, what Marchbot does is um, it takes all the pull requests um, up to a fixed number that, that currently have passed CI uh, and uh, creates a temporary branch uh, Oops, uh, creates a temporary branch um, with all the good pull requests, which means uh, they are, have passed CI, and also you don't have a merge conflict when you, uh, when you try to merge it into the existing uh, temp branch. And the rest is, is ignored for now, and then uh, you try running CI on the temp branch. If it works, you throw the temp branch away and then merge all the uh, individual branches in the same order, you merge them to the temp branch, and uh, otherwise, if it fails, you go back to either splitting the temp branch or merging things one by one. And that makes it quite scalable. Cool. And that's basically it. I mean, this is how you get a green master. Uh, but there's more. But before uh, we go to that, uh, Mika is going to tell you uh, about the peculiarities of our uh, workflow and our requirements. Thank you, Alexander. So among the other things I mentioned, I worry about compliance. I can see sneakers. And I worry about how it affects engineering. And the workflow we have is impacted by requirements due to regulatory jurisdictions and auditings. As for background, we have about 70 engineers 
split across 11 teams, and they maintain roughly 130 unique and individual services. That's a lot. Commis land in master every few minutes, as you can see, and in branches even at a higher rate. Marge is merely a gatekeeper. We ship to production about once an hour, so 10 times a day, more or less. And as we add more engineers, more teams, more projects, we cannot have this become any slower. So, are there any of you who work in a regular industry? I have a few. Have you had to change your workflow due to auditing requirements? I have, wow, more hands than before. <laughs> okay, question. Were those fixes for the better? Or at least did they improve your workflow? Okay, so this is where Marge comes in. So, as I mentioned, we are in an industry where we get audited all the time. And requirements vary by country by country. We can't cherry pick what we do. We satisfy all of them at the same time. It's not an option. It has to be done. And since we want to maintain the velocity, we cannot cripple the workflow. This is the thing that Marge actually provides us, and it also made auditors and auditings easier, which you wouldn't believe is even possible. So think about requirements, what you might have. Auditors want to know who, who wrote the code, when, how was it tested, who approved it, when was it shipped, okay, who shipped it, who thought it was even a good idea to write this piece of code? Yeah, these are questions you might want to know even if you weren't being audited. They are basically development hygiene. What we do with this is we add Git and March to the mix. We get out of the box, commit themselves, they tell us who and when. That's an easy, easy part. Git and March bot, in particular with trailers, which Alexander will expand later on, tell us exactly who tested, who approved, when was it built, part of which series. We have Mars rewrite the commits and add these as a trailer so we can see from commits when they happened and actually what was the history. And then we, for deployments, we adapted our ship tool to record all the deployments against the commits they were built from in Git notes. Don't do this. The UI for Git notes is atrocious, but it actually works nicely when you know what you're doing. Eventually, the question is, why do we do this with Git? Mostly because you can get all of this from other tooling. They are third-party solutions that give you most of this out of the box. But then what you have is that information is now held in the vault of that particular product. You are locked into a particular vendor, particular product, particular workflow. You can't change what you do. And you can see the couple of white items. Those are business decisions. I can't help you there. Nobody can. You know what you're doing and why. But the point of you doing this in Git is that it makes it easier to work with and it allows us anyone to clone the repo and get the full history of only not who, what was done but also when it was gotten in production. Because as far as auditors are concerned, Git is pretty handy. It provides not immutability, which auditors would love, but it gives the next best thing. It gives tamper evidence. You can rewrite history, but at that point you change your commit hashes. It is obvious that someone has mucked about and done horrible things to your Git repo. It's familiar. You all know how to use it. If you don't, you're very close to get learning it. And above anything, it's platform agnostic. It runs absolutely anywhere. Maybe not on QNX, but who uses that? In any case, the idea is that we are not bound to any particular solution, any particular vendor. What we have is a solution which scales with us and allows us to move as time passes to other vendors, other products, and keep developing as we want. And I'll hand over back to Alexander about how the workflows work in practice. So over to you. Cool. So uh, at Sparkers, we use a monorepo and a rebase-based workflow. And I want to talk a little bit about some motivations and get workflow theory versus practice. Uh, because uh, I think, in theory, some things sound quite attractive. So for example, submodules sound quite attractive as an idea. Let's say you've got a um, development model where most of your things are microservices. Uh, why not have one repo per microservice and uh, have one big repo, which is like the actual production repo, and you have those microservices sub-repos, because that's quite nice. It gives you like a macro view of what actually is in production and a micro view of the individual repos. And uh, typically, developers for a particular service only have to care about the service. When they do 
Git crap or clone or whatever, so it just gets stuff that's relevant to them. It's easier to set up CI or so, so it sounds quite tempting, right? Uh, similarly, uh, merging sounds like quite a good strategy uh, because you again have the sort of macro micro distinction. Um, when you rebase, you typically lose the information where stuff came from, whereas when you merge, you can typically with a feature-based uh, approach, you can have a, you can see a merge commit for every feature that was merged. Uh, so uh, the merge commits are the micro view and uh, the individual things on the branches sort of give you some drill down into the development decisions that were taken. And an uh, important point also is for auditing and whatever else, uh, you sort of have the same history all the time. Uh, that has many benefits. Okay, but uh, as often theory and practice, I think, are not that well aligned. Uh, so in practice, uh, submodules, when you do like a uh, Google image search for some, uh, well, even people in India are complaining about them. Uh, and um, I think the solution is basically just go monorepo or use some other solutions. I think uh, submodules uh, add far too much brittleness and complexity to be worth it in practice. Uh, another problem with a merge-based um, uh, approach is uh, reverting things in Git is, is, is a pain. I mean, like uh, there's a famous email where Linus tells you how to revert things properly and, uh, well, good luck getting everyone in your organization to actually understand its contents and not mess up uh, your master branch. Uh, let's see how we revert things in uh, Smarkets. We say git revert merge request and send the merge request number. So um, which one would you rather use if production is broken? Uh, Cool. Uh, a similar problem with merge-based um, or default uh, Git workflows is it's difficult to figure out what actually broke something. And typically, uh, when you do a feature-based development, you ca care about which pull request also that was merged and broke things in production. And uh, you might be thinking, oh, okay, I know I'm just going to use Git by sec to find this out. Well, good luck to you, um, because um, in practice, uh, Git bisect uh, is quite difficult to actually get anything useful out, because uh, without some third party tooling, you can't easily just look at merge requests, for example. Uh, also, um, one problem with bisecting things often is, as we saw before, uh, in a realistic setup, not every commit will be tested, which means not every commit will have um, passed uh, CI and work, and uh, that means uh, bisect will sort of stumble over some random problems, like you might be looking for some severe bug, and, and, and the test fails because some linter failed on this commit, or some nonsense like this. Okay, so uh, uh, how do we deal with that at markets? Well, the March board way is you say, git bisect one tested, where test.sh is uh, a shell script that uh, actually exhibits the problem. And uh, what this does is it only uh, looks at commits that actually went through CI. So you can be pretty sure that there is no completely spurious breakage which, which messes up your, your bisection. So how does all of this work? So um, as a quick reminder, this is how we were running a bare bones march setup. And you can like add more flags and you get more features. Uh, awesome. Uh, so let's look at a concrete example. So here's an actual bare bones commit, uh, which we use to um, bump our version of March in uh, our own environment at markets. If we add the add reviewers feature, you can see that March bought a revolt history to add a reviewed by trailer. Uh, so Sonic uh, was the um, reviewer in GitLab. Uh, so then uh, for the bisection, we can um, at the add tested flag, what that does is uh, it takes uh, the last commit on a feature branch, which is the one that you know past CI, and it's a tested by trailer, which uh, leads you back to the merge request, which, uh, apart from making it easier to protect things, uh, also is very convenient uh, to figure out why something is there or to see uh, uh, the actual tests that were run. Uh, and then finally, we've got our add part of, um, and this is almost the same as tested by, it adds uh, a link back to the merge request, but it does it on every um, uh, commit in the pull request, uh, not just the final one. So uh, this combination is quite nice because basically you sort of have uh, the benefits of both a merge-based and a rebase-based workflow. Uh, one big thing about the merge-based workflow is you can sort of see 
uh, that certain things are features that were shipped in, and you can still see this here. Cool. Uh, and then uh, once we have those things, uh, we can basically just have a couple of, of um, Git aliases which uh, use those trailers to provide the functionality I showed before. Uh, Bus Act 1 tested and also reverts. There are a few other ones. Um, okay. So uh, assuming, assuming uh, you're kind of convinced that those things or some subset of them is, is useful, what should you do if you can't use uh, MarchBot? Well, at least uh, uh, you now know uh, what you're missing. And uh, uh, if you don't need something general, actually it's not that hard to do some custom solution. Uh, uh, we also welcome PRs if you want to add another backend. And uh, there are some similar tools. Other people have seen the light. For example, Rust, uh, Rust Homo or so uh, does something similar for, for uh, GitHub. Um, good, so uh, I'm going to wrap up with this. Uh, so, in summary, a good PR workflow doesn't test just the feature branch, it tests the future master and ensures that uh, your master branch won't be broken. Uh, good doesn't equal common as, open, as always, but in fact it's not that hard to do. If you use GitLab, I encourage you to try much. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, look for some similar solution uh, or build one yourself, it might not be that hard. With March, you get some extra perks which are quite useful and uh, finally, I think, monorepos and rebased based workflow is nicer. So, uh, so what's, what's one thing here is uh, uh, there's a slight contradiction here uh, between uh, us claiming to automatically maintain a repository of codes that always passes all the tests and having those um, build pass trailers. I mean, the only reason why you have some uh, in uh, GitHub or GitLab is because your workflow is kind of broken, so you want to know whether the master is broken. And uh, given that we host uh, MarchBot on GitHub where it doesn't work, um, uh, we are not dogfooding it at the moment. Cool. Um, so I'm just briefly going to pop up the credits, and then uh, I'm ready to take questions. Uh, anyone? Hello, is there any question? I have a question. Uh, please stand up and come here. Yeah. If, if there are no questions, I can say a little bit about implementation details also. Uh, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> no questions? Okay, no. cool. We have one. Ah, sorry, yeah. Okay, please come. Hmm? Uh, how deeply baked is the uh, GitLab integration? I mean, does it just call the API or? It just calls the API. All right, so. Uh, it it should other, translate uh, quite straightforwardly to GitHub. Yeah, yeah. I, I was also wondering, wondering because we're actually using Jenkins for CI, yeah. and I was also wondering about uh, calling uh, we Jenkins do too. API. But uh, that's, that's not a problem. So because um, the way it works is uh, you can configure different CI backends in GitLab. Um, and all that March does is um, it relies on you having configured GitLab correctly, namely uh, saying you need to have passed CI, uh, so it doesn't care about the underlying build system uh, or CI system. Um, it just uses the GitLab API to merge things in. All right, thank you. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, let's all welcome Mr. Alessandra and Mika again. Thanks for the awesome presentation.